I was walking into the gym to go swimming, and this mom was walking out with two little girls, and one of the little girls pointed up at me, and she said, look at that big lady. That kid's been watching Sesame Street. She knows her shapes. <laughs> and the mom said, yes, isn't she beautiful? And then the little girl looked back up at me and said, mm, nope. <laughs> I've been performing that joke for over seven years now, and every single time I do, I'm reminded that children don't know what is good or bad until we tell them. I'm really lucky at this point in my life to have both a part-time stand-up comedy career and a professional counseling practice, and something that I've learned from combining them both in an unlikely way is that joke writing can serve as sort of a humorous thought replacement activity. When I work with clients in cognitive behavioral therapy, we'll do an activity where we identify their automatic negative thoughts and then confront and challenge those thoughts and then replace them with a more helpful or positive thought. And I took that one step further, <laughs> and in my helpful or more positive thought, I try to build a punchline. But I'm not here to tell you how writing jokes is going to make you less depressed or less anxious, because I don't believe it's that simple. I'm here to talk about how I applied it to my own personal growth and work, and how I found it to be a much more <sighs> connecting and life-changing experience than I had anticipated. If I had experienced that event in my teens or my 20s, I would have been overwhelmed by shame. Shame about having a fat body. I would have thought, look at this tiny child. They already know that my body's unacceptable. But here's the thing. I am a big lady. That kid was accurate, right? I mean, the word fat as an adjective is neutral. The world has weaponized it against bodies like mine. But that mom, by validating that little girl's accuracy and giving her the option of complimenting me, the option, uh, she you know, reinforced her knowledge without enforcing fear and shame about bodies. That little girl can now trust her instincts on what is correct, sizes and shapes of things, and not have a fear of fatness, you know, reinforced for her. And some of you might be thinking that mom's job is to make sure her daughter grows up happy and healthy and obesity is not healthy. And this talk is also not about defending my right to exist in this body without being shamed, uh, or to prove to you that fatness is not correlated to unhealth. So I will simply say that numerous studies now show that weight is an unreliable indicator of health. I would also invite you to confront your ideas about body size and health, and ask yourself why someone else's body size stirs an emotional response within you. This is where confronting and processing our shame begins, and it is not comfortable, but it's essential. If I added up uh, all of the years that I've participated in therapy, not counting counselor grad school, which is like forced therapy, <laughs> it would be about 12-ish. And some of those years were regular appointments every two weeks, and some of them monthly or quarterly check-ins, and one of those years included 10 weeks of targeted trauma processing therapy. Currently, it's about every two weeks or so. This is a really vulnerable admission for a therapist, but I'm sharing it for a really important reason. Given our current stigma and shame around mental illness, it's important that you know that doing our work or seeing a therapist is nothing to be ashamed of. I can stand here with 100% certainty and tell you that it was the path to me being on this stage right now. And I would do it again in a heartbeat, all of it. I used to hate my body. And I know that's a strong word, but I believe it's accurate. And this hatred came from numerous places. Some of it from modeling from people that I knew. Most of it from cultural and media messaging about my body. Fat bodies are not respected in American culture. In fact, they are actively demonized and hated. Fatness is seen as a moral failure, and fat-bodied characters and people are depicted as gluttonous, idiotic, unattractive and sexless, and devoid of value. 
literally headless. I did not cut off any of those heads, by the way. All of these images were done <laughs> on internet searches for obesity and fat people. When one only sees themselves depicted in one type of way, it's really hard not to believe that to be true about themselves. Eventually, this hatred of my body transferred to my non-physical form, and somewhere around age 13, I determined that in order to be liked, I would need to distract from my disgusting and unsympathetic fat body. And so I became a jokester. I started acting in plays and musicals. I became as likable as possible. And I always took the shot at my own fat body before anybody else could. Recently, a longtime friend said she was very surprised to hear <laughs> that I finally felt secure and like my authentic self. You were always so bold and confident, she said. I was performing what I thought confidence looked like. After all, I had years of theater training. <laughs> But inside, I still felt like I was of no value to anyone unless I could make them laugh or make their life easier. And I was of absolutely no value to a romantic partner. I wonder if there are places in your life where you feel judged, where you feel like you have to distract or make up for things that the world deems unattractive. My journey from there to here has been a very long one, and I would love to tell you that I started down a path to loving myself and found freedom, but I can't do that. My path from stepping away from diet culture and self-hatred and moving towards health at every size and loving myself had many steps and setbacks. And listen, I'm still on that journey, okay? Some days are better than others. I'm already planning not to read the comments when this video gets posted. <laughs> but when I started to do the really deep and painful work of addressing my shame and pain about having a fat body and living in it, shame about experiencing intimate partner violence, and that core belief that I was not worthy of a respectful and loving partner, then I could start using those stories on stage. And I'm not the first person to talk about deeply personal, painful, or socially taboo things on a comedy stage. Maria Bamford is a well-known professional comedian. She talks very openly about her experience with bipolar disorder 2 and obsessive compulsive disorder. Tig Notaro's famous Live album was recorded right after she was diagnosed with breast cancer, and it chronicles her hospitalization and the sudden tragic death of her mother. Chris Gethard's 2017 comedy special, Career Suicide, tackles his very long-term struggle with depression and suicidal thoughts. And Richard Pryor has been talking about addiction and racial issues like for decades. And I can't speak for these comics, right, and their experience with this. But for myself, the key to using these stories on stage was to turn them around and make a punchline about how the world viewed me or my experience, or to make the butt of the joke the person who abused me rather than my abuse. I had decided shortly before that incident with the young girl that I was no longer interested in perpetuating stereotypes about marginalized groups, and that included my own body. So I started telling these stories on stage, <laughs> and something surprising happened. People started approaching me after shows and thanking me for sharing difficult stories or saying, well, if that happened to you, then like, I don't feel so alone. And so not only was I creating laughter, but I was also creating connection, and this was a real turning point for me. Brene Brown is a researcher and an author, and she talks in her work about shame and vulnerability and how shame cannot exist being brought into the light. It cannot survive empathy. And so by bringing these stories on stage, I was bringing my shame into the light, like literally, and it was quickly losing its power to harm me and keep me in shame. When I required surgery to remove a potentially very dangerous large cyst from an ovary, I went to a specialty surgeon and she looked at my MRI film and she said, do you see that oval in there? That's all your bones and muscles and organs. And all that stuff on the outside, that's just fat. Look at that skinny woman in there dying to get out. 
this was profoundly painful for me. I thought I might have cancer, and she was using it as a teachable moment about my weight. So eventually, I turn this into a bit. I tell that story, and then I add, I know she's in there, I told her. I ate her, she's digesting, just leave it. I started to wonder what this might do for my personal and offstage life, so I started slowly sharing vulnerable experiences, thoughts, feelings with people that were safe to do that with, close people that I cared for. And as it turns out, when they're the right people, they will allow you to share your pain and they won't try to fix it. They won't try to one-up you with their pain and they won't try to dismiss it. They'll just hold space for you to be in it. That in and of itself is healing, but then often they'll, they would return it. They would share like, hey, I've felt a similar way. And so now suddenly we don't feel so alone and we're more connected and we feel stronger. And it was during one of these situations that something happened I was not anticipating, and I think it gets to the root of my talk. My friend Stephen, who is a thin-bodied, cisgendered white man, shared with me what it meant to him for me to share my story. He told me that in listening to me, he recognized that my experience in my body was deeply impacted by the world's standards and expectations what they thought a body should be. And that I shared with him how that had hurt me so badly and impacted almost every area of my life, he started to question these standards, these expectations. And what were they based in? Like, were they based in facts? He is a scientist and deeply interested in facts. <laughs> no, he said, they were arbitrary. He started thinking about different societal rules, like the rule that men can't wear dresses, and what was that based in? And nothing, he said. <laughs> Just that they don't, usually, and people get uncomfortable if they do. And then he told me something that really surprised me. He said, I started thinking about how you were showing me that your body was valid, a fat body that the world rejected. And if that was true, that has to apply then to all bodies, are valid. And he started thinking about trans bodies, and he said, how could I ever reject someone's biology because it, it's not the same as my experience or expectation? This amazed me. All I wanted to do was share my whole self with people I cared about and was safe with. I had not set out to change Stephen's thoughts on trans folks, okay? But here we were, <laughs> both changed by this experience. And I think this can apply to almost any difference that two human beings can experience. And I believe both professionally and personally that confronting and examining our beliefs and doing the often difficult work that comes with the pain that comes up in those examinations can really allow us to connect with others in a safe and affirming way. And I think these, these examinations, these connections, they will change us in ways we can't even fathom today, right now. And everybody approaches this examination differently, and I am wildly biased as a therapist <laughs> and a person who's experienced really good therapy, but I do think it's a good place to start. And I would also recommend consuming art and culture, news and media that's different than you normally would be exposed to. A huge help to me on my journey was to start following more fat-bodied people on Instagram, just to see my body in media more, to normalize it for myself. And so I return to my original invitation. <clears throat> what beliefs might you have about fat bodies or trans bodies or black and brown bodies or disabled bodies or any body different than you that keeps you from connecting to the person inside of it? Try to tap into that little girl just pointing out sizes and shapes without applying arbitrary standards and expectations. You might be surprised what she has to teach you. You might be surprised how she might change you. Thank you. <laughs>